Eva Henry? Here. Jeff Baker? Here. Bill Holland? Elise Jones? Here. David Beacom? Here. Randy Wheelock? Sean Wood? Christy Fanganello? Anthony Graves? Kevin Flynn? Here. Roger Partridge? Laura Thomas? Ron Angles? Libby Zabo? Casey Ty? Bob Pfeiffer? Here. Bob Roth? Here. Larry Vidham? David Spellman? Aaron Brockett? Here. Ann Justin? Lynn Baca? Tara Radloff? Roger Hudson? George Teal? For people to go. Jason Bauer? Tammy Mauer? Carrie Penaloza? Fine. Catherine Heider? Fine. Laura Chrisman? Here. Richard Champion? Gail Christie? Rick Teeter? Benjamin Huseman? Here. Debbie Nasta? Catherine Whitman? Steve Conklin? Here. Linda Olson, Here. Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Present. Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Henry Ergot, Scott Norquist, Storm Glor, Jim Dale, Here. Ron Rakowski, George Lance, Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Hello. Dana Gouwein, Jacob LeBure, Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Kyle Schlachter, Jacob Lofgren, Larry Strock, Wynn Shaw. Here. John Peck. Here. Ashley Stolzman. Here. Connie Sullivan. Dan Greenberg. Colleen Whitlow. Joyce Palazuski. Deborah Jerome. Sean Foray. Chris Larson. Jordan Sowers. Julie Mullica. John Dyack. Here. Sally Daigle. Roberta Mooney. Rita Dozal. Here. Jessica Sandgren. Jackie Phillips. Herb Atchison, Shannon Bird, Bud Starker, Here. Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter. Very good. Um, so I'm going to start out the meeting. Uh, this meeting is generally chaired by the vice chair. Herb has a uh, another meeting that he's coming from, and so I'll start out whenever he shows up. I'll turn the meeting over to him and. I don't know if that's five minutes or 15 minutes. I do think it would be funny, since we have a very light agenda, if we finish before he gets here. I think that would be hilarious. Make him drive down here for nothing. <laughs> so uh, under attachment A, there's a summary of the November 1st work session minutes. Any changes, additions, corrections? Seeing none, they'll be accepted as they are. Public comment. Uh, we do allow public comment up to three minutes per person that would like to address the board. We do ask that there be no public comment for an item that there's already been a public hearing in the past. Is there anybody that would like to address the body? Seeing nobody? I just want to check in really quick, actually. It's Jessica Sandgren calling in from Thornton. Thank you. Um, so we have two items this evening. Neither one of them are action items. Both of them are informational items only. The first one is under attachment B, discussion of proposed amendments to the Metro Vision. Mr. Calvert. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's see. Low, I'm also on day six of a cold, and I can hear almost nothing in my ears. We need to adjust volume. That, that seems better. Okay. The green light would help, too. Um, but my eyes, I can't blame it on my eyes. Um, so the chair gave me some pressure to sort of hurry up uh, with this item, but I, I will spend enough time to hopefully get folks oriented to uh, this. Uh, my colleagues and I up at the table were sort of just talking about this. Um, just, I know there's a lot of, we have a fair number of new members both here and obviously at the regular board meetings, and we go through a process every year to amend sort of the foundational plans that Dr. Cog works on, both our Metro Vision plan as well as our regional transportation plan. And you're seeing some of these amendments in sort of drips and drabs and in sort of different items. So just know that this is part of a, of a bigger picture that you're getting in sort of in, in chunks that are ready for your, uh, for your consideration. This is not an action, as the chair mentioned, but we just were, this is an item that is sort of half heads up 
half uh, check-in. And so I'll, I'll, I'll spend most of the time on sort of the check-in part, and I'll explain why we wanted to bring this item to you here um, in a second. But as I mentioned, uh, you, the board has actually already taken action, a preliminary action on a set of amendments uh, back in December related to our regional transportation plan. You gave staff guidance to take a several projects and to model the air quality impacts of those changes to the regional transportation plan. You will see the results of that air quality analysis when you take action on, on all of these amendments. This is just another set of, of sort of similar actions that we're going to run by you uh, today. Um, for those that are um, new, uh, the board unanimously adopted uh, the MetroVision plan um, back in January of last year. Uh, we really, as a board, have been working on the same plan through minor revisions and major revisions for the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, and that, that plan has a long-standing principle that the, that the board will make minor revisions um, annually and major updated updates to the plan as needed. So the last time the board went through a MetroVision update process, many of you lived through five years of that, that was clearly um, a major update, but we also, as of October, asked for um, other minor amendments um, as well. And I know just for the new folks, I know you're being asked to, to think about something that you might not be that familiar with related to MetroVision. I'll just sort of give you a few heads up. Um, we've got a couple of items coming to the board um, in the next couple of months that I think will help, help you with some context um, on the MetroVision plan. And then we're in the process of scheduling what we call short courses um, as well that will be really helpful for new uh, board members as well. So I know that you're still in your fire hose uh, moment, but there will be some, some footholds along the way to help you sort of um, uh, get grounded in the, sort of the conversations that we're asking you to have this evening and, and in similar uh, venues. So uh, our, the amendments to the plan typically come in two stripes. Um, there are member-initiated uh, um, amendments. So we put a call out. People say we would like to change this part of the plan. Um, but then we also actually do staff-initiated uh, amendments as well, like just reflecting on the plan as, as adopted. There are some things that we might bring forward to uh, the board to ask you to sort of consider um, as you're considering other amendments as well. And that's, that's the item I'm, I'm going to spend most of the time on uh, this evening is one um, amendment that we are suggesting that we would ask you to really kind of collectively think through with us, and I'll talk about that here a little bit more, and then I'm going to give you a heads up on a few member submitted items um, that came in as well. And this is all to sort of ground you a little bit in uh, the public review materials that will be put out probably in the next 10 days or so related to plan amendments. So this way you will have seen a lot of the items that we will be asking the public to review and that you will be asked to take action on uh, most likely in the, in the April time frame. So I'm going to talk about one amendment, again, initiated by staff. Uh, the memo lays this out, the presentation lays this out as sort of two separate components. It's really the same thing, but we're trying to sort of make the conversation as easy to track uh, as possible. So there is uh, the, the plan, for those that were involved, you recall, has 13 overarching plan performance measures um, in the adopted MetroVision plan. Um, one of them, as stated, uh, reads, uh, share of the region's housing and employment near high-frequency transit. Uh, and so that's actually the item that we're bringing forward uh, to you tonight for some guidance. We have a, a proposed approach, but we want to kind of get your feedback. Um, and one of the reasons we obviously want to uh, tie in um, this conversation with you all is uh, for those that participated in the uh, MetroVision deliberations um, back in, let's call it 2014, 2015, 2016 timeframe, the board spent a lot of time talking about performance measures. So we thought this was important enough to bring to you and just sort of get a check-in moment with you on these um, potential changes. Uh, so we are looking to change ultimately kind of two components of that, how we describe the measure itself, and then also um, due to an error that's explained in the memo, and I'll explain a little bit more in my presentation, uh, we, we miscalculated the baseline, which then ultimately meant you ha were having a conversation about an aspirational target that was, that was built on sort of a faulty calculation. So we want to clean that, that up as well. Um, so a little bit about we are suggesting a change from the term high-frequency transit in this measure to high-capacity uh, transit. Um, hopefully the memo does a reasonable job of, of laying this out. But we ultimately are interested in areas that are served in our region by sort of the highest quality transit service um, in the region, right? And so you can think of that in two pretty simple components, sort of your fixed guideway, light rail, commuter rail, bus rapid transit, and then you can think of that as sort of your highest level uh, bus, uh, local bus service. Um, when it comes to the local bus service, we very much think of that as frequency, right? So we, were, we look to identify bus stops that are served basically by a bus every 15 minutes throughout an entire day. 
That is how we determine which bus stops would be considered high-frequency bus stops. And then we think of anything in the sort of light rail, commuter rail, bus rapid transit as sort of higher capacity transit. But we don't really necessarily, from our methodology standpoint, think of frequency. And so to us, it felt a little misleading to describe the measure as frequency. And we were looking for a term that maybe brings that together. And so we are suggesting the term um, high capacity. So again, highest the, the bus stops that have buses you know, basically 96 buses a day. Every 15 minutes through our 24-hour day, there's a bus that is, that is stopping there. To give you an idea, that's less than 10% less than of the bus stops in RTD system. So it's the highest serving uh, bus stops. Think of the one right out here at 13th and Lincoln that has buses um, on it every all hours um, of the day. And I'll explain the sort of the other piece um, as well. Um, and it sort of tells you what our intent was and kind of the error that me, we made when putting baseline information um, in front of you. We were looking for those bus stops that, again, have a, has basically an a, a departure on average every 15 minutes. So that, that works out to 96 departures over a 24-hour window during a weekday. That, that was our intent as we were thinking about it. Uh, when we actually did the calculation and put the, the baseline numbers in front of the board, we got a few tables crisscrossed and ended up actually adding weekday as well as Saturday and Sunday service. So we ended up adding more stops uh, to, that, to that sort of geography than we really had intended to. Um, so that's really, we're just simply trying to sort of step back and sort of do it the right way. Um, we are in the process of one of the things that the board will hear um, in the next few months is an update on all observations related to performance measures. And we discovered this and sort of gearing up uh, for that um, exercise. So this slide, and it's also in your memo, and again, kind of in two um, disparate pieces, so hopefully this can kind of bring it back together. Uh, this shows both what's in the existing adopted plan and, and as well as what uh, staff is uh, proposing, and we would really like to get your, your feedback on. Um, so again, the measure as described, named in the plan, is high frequency transit. We think a fair term is probably high capacity transit. Um, this portion of the table shows you the baseline um, data that was ultimately provided to the board, again, and through a miscalculation, and, and the targets that were set by the board based on those numbers. So staff is now saying this is actually what the baseline is if we applied our met methodology uh, correctly. So in, in both cases, they drop uh, pretty significantly. And so therefore, we want to put that in front of you as well as maybe some suggestions as to how uh, we might reset, you might reset um, those targets for, for the year uh, 2040. So in the, following the methodology as proposed, um, though miscalculated previously, about 14% of uh, the area's um, housing stock was located within those high capacity uh, transit areas back in 2014 and we're suggesting a target of 20% um, in the year 2040 and you can follow the same uh, logic on the employment side. Um, as noted in the memo, you could think of these, for those that participated in the sort of baseline performance target setting, uh, the board was really looking for that sweet spot between aspirational targets and achievable targets, right? That was where the, the magic started to happen. We were, we were hitting those um, sorts of sweet spots. We tried to reflect that again um, this time around and kind of the thing that staff is bringing uh, forward to you. You know, one way to think about this, and it's, it's, it's alluded to in the memo, is sort of average annual change that you would have to see to be able to achieve um, these targets. Um, and these are slightly more ambitious than the previous uh, target in terms of what you would need to see year over year. But based on a couple of years of observation, we're actually well ahead of that trend. So we felt pretty comfortable making them slightly more ambitious than the targets that were previously associated uh, with those baselines. Um, just to kind of maybe bring it sort of all together as to how ultimately as a region we make uh, progress on that in, uh, particular performance measure, there are really two ways to get there. You can expand the area covered by high capacity transit, so increasing your fixed gu guideway service, more areas served by uh, frequent bus service. There, therefore, you have more housing and employment that would be captured within the geographies around those areas. And then obviously you can also add housing and jobs to those areas. So there's sort of multiple ways to, to ultimately show progress um, on that measure. And in many ways, the, they should be related to each other. As you see more increased um, population and employment density, hopefully you would also see an uptick um, in transit service. And hopefully with an uptick in transit service, there is more appetite for higher density development in those areas as well. So hopefully they build off each other uh, so that both components are working um, towards the same uh, sort of degree of progress. 
I hope I've not confused folks. Um, I, I don't know how technical that felt, but I'm happy to sort of answer questions. In general, we're here. Again, there's no action. We just wanted to sort of share our work as we intended to, to, to make public during the public review process and just really check in with the group that spent a lot of time obviously working with staff on these measures to feel like if you wanted to give us um, uh, some guidance as to whether there's a different way to think about this, uh, whether this seemed consistent with the intent um, when the board was having uh, previous conversations on performance measures and target. So I'd like to pause and maybe talk about this. I have one other slide that's more of a housekeeping thing just to do the full uh, sort of uh, detail related to other amendments you're going to see in the future, but I think this is the primary uh, gist of what I would love to uh, discuss with you all this evening. So obviously staff is asking for guidance on what our thoughts and, and questions might be, so questions or comments? Director Flynn. Thank you. I'm trying to think this through and understand what the practical implications are down the road. And does the term um, high capacity encompass high frequency? In other words, if RTD runs a four-car train every half hour, it's the same as running, it's the same capacity as running two-car trains every 15 minutes. But the frequency isn't there and could affect ridership. Uh, so are we excluding? Uh, what are we excluding by this? Obviously, we're excluding a lot if it lowers our numbers that much. Uh See, I would attempt an answer, and we can figure out if I've got my, okay. my wires crossed. Um, as I sort of alluded to earlier, you know, we have sort of two components of the transit system that we're trying to spatially identify, sort of fixed guideway, light rail, commuter rail, BRT, and then your highest frequency, highest level of service, bus service, bus service at a particular stop, right, because you need that, that geography. So this, again, this stop out here is a great example. There are at least eight routes that hit that stop buses in and out of there um, all the time. Um, so we think of frequency when we think of the bus service at that stop, but anything that you would call your fixed guideway transit, we're just calling that corridor, we're including that regardless of frequency of service because of those types of changes that you mentioned. You could go to four cars less frequently to two cars right. more frequently. Rather than getting into how that might change over time, let's just call that high capacity and continue to say that those are trunk line components of our system that we as a region would want to have uh, mm -hmm. as much population employment, obviously in line with local growth right. aspirations as possible around that service. To the extent that it drives that, however, and now recognizing that being from Denver, we have a lot of, we have a lot of high capacity and high frequency transit stops, but in my particular district, uh, we don't have very much in southwest Denver, so I'm looking from that lens right now and wondering, will that end up driving jobs uh, and housing uh, options away from my part of town and toward other parts? Uh, and, and I don't know how I'd feel about that. On, the, on RTD's Northwest Rail, for example, uh, the capacity might be there, but the frequency isn't. I think their service plan was to run a train every hour, uh, which, which isn't very good for, for building ridership. I mean, just to respond to the, the, the first part of the question, I, I think this measure attempts to sort of look at the logical places where those things overlap, where population density and highest degree of transit service overlap. Those are the places that this measure is trying to quantify, that we, we would like to see, you know, more population and employment in areas with high transit service, but we'd recognize the chicken and egg part of that conversation. So, All right, thank you. Yep. I'll, I'll have to read a lot more on this before. Okay. Director Brockett. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I missed, are you going to incorporate the description of the meaning of capacity into the description text under, I forget exactly where this goes in the plan, but some of those explanations that you just gave us. Sure. Uh, so as, as the, when you see, when, when the, if the, let's just play this out, that the plan were amended, uh, what you would really see is you would see this measure description change here, and you would see the baseline and the target. We have sort of background information that describes sort of our methodological approach to um, performing uh, measure analysis and observation, we would, al we would also make sure that that uh, background information and sort of supplement information is reflective of sort of the methodological description um, that I gave you. So the plan itself does not get into the sort of the, the nuts and bolts details about how this is measured, but we do have supporting documents that we shared sort of during the measure process with the board. We would make sure that those things are reflective as well. Um, in terms of the, 
the sort of second part of what we're bringing forward here, the baseline change and the target change, we're not changing methodology. The methodology is the same. Sure. We just, frankly, made a mistake uh, the first time we tried to apply the methodology. I, I guess just something to think about, because I think capacity is a little less clear than frequency. I mean, it, it's, it sounds like big buses or big trains, right? And whereas frequency is very clear, it's something that's coming along very often. And so your definition of capacity includes both, but it's not really obvious. Yep. So I, I would think about maybe how to present that with this chain. I, I would love to tell you how many times Andy and I have talked about which of these <laughs> terms feels best to us. So we were, we're open. If there's another term, if you all want to live with frequency and the reality that maybe it's not exactly spot on on the fixed guideway side of things, I don't think we as staff have any major reservations about that. We were just looking for the term that is most reflective of what the methodology is, is trying to, to surface. Say capacitive frequency? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> is that a motion? No. <laughs> uh, director Shaw, then Director Dozal. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, I guess I'm struggling with the word as well, and I wonder if a word that might even be more vague could actually work with, with a you know, subtext of what it represents, volume high volume, whether it be high volume of stops, high volume of people, but, but I, I too am struggling with the word. Thank you. Director Dozal, before I call on you, was there somebody on the phone that wanted to get in the queue? Okay, Director Dozal. Yeah, I had the same concerns about the word. It didn't fit. When I hear you describe it, it fits better. It's really the availability of transit, high capacity. So maybe it's the availability. Is it there? Is it available? Can people get on it? You know, is it a train or a bus or whatever? Uh, so I, the capacity, too, sounded more, it didn't describe it for me as well. Um, and then, but my question was going to be, if we take or have you taken RTDs and fast tracks plan out to 2040 of where they're going to add high availability of transit, high capacity transit, and will that, if they actually build per their plan, will that get us to the 20 percent? The, the, hard, the hard part is the bus service side of things is, is projecting out bus service. I mean, I don't know, have we done, and I don't think we have with this current sort of baseline and, and, and target um, an analysis based on our forecast and our assumptions about the 2040 network. But I'd yeah, love overlay, to phone a friend if you want to have any. Overlay the network or the Pardon? plan. Overlay the plan and see how many more housing and job numbers you bring into that plan. I'm talking about the RTD yeah. plan yeah. or Fast Tracks plan or whatever. It would be kind of an interesting analysis to me to see how close or how much we move toward the 20 percent are we going to have to what do we have to do separately from sure. rtd and as, as i mentioned previously i mean one of the we discovered this error in thinking through our first set of new observations that we were going to bring to you and that's the type of analysis that we will do along the way with that as well so that we can bring some context to you know we can you know let's let's call it a couple of months from now we will have a four year 14 15 and 16 observation on this target um, and the measure, but that's something that we could sort of help tell the story of assumptions as they exist today, will we get there, or are there other things that we need to be thinking about to make sure that we can hit this target? Director Holan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the th things that concerns me in the, in the, in the long-term projection is um, how do you factor in uh, potential growth Particularly, for example, Aurora, we've been we've been uh, threatened to cut back our frequency uh, because the ridership has not been built. But we have uh, several uh, thousands of, of uh, apartments being constructed in the area near the uh, near the various points. And um, <coughs> in terms of planning, how can we incorporate that those potentials, which will clearly have an impact on our ridership uh, and um, uh, impact the, the, the 2040 uh, goals. Did everyone hear the commissioner's question or do you want me to repeat it? Got it. I mean, that's, I mean so in some ways that's why we think that this, this measure works well together to sort of in some ways almost control for that chicken and egg part of the conversation and why we 
really wanted to treat fixed guideway different than let's just call it air quotes local bus service is that the hope is that playing out over the long term again this is a 2040 target that that investment will ultimately spur the market to deliver more units those additional units will ultimately spur a higher degree of service such that that frequency will keep up with the development side of things so that's on the longer view the hope is that that begins to kind of normalize out uh, over time Other questions or comments? Director Jones. I'm still noodling over what the right word is. Another option would be high quality. And you would, of course, say, well, what's high quality? And you'd say, well, if there's fixed guideway capacity or fr high frequency buses. I think any, any word you choose, you're going to need to define it. OK. Director Beacom. Slightly different concern. Since we're changing what will be the outcome data that we're looking at, cutting things basically in a half or two-thirds. How do we handle the change in data so that someone looking at something doesn't look at it as a retrenchment or a fallback or a failure? Well, I mean, that's, that's an important why for us this, this rises to the level of a plan amendment, right? So uh, were this to carry forward in whatever shape, form, or fashion, anytime someone looks at the, the adopted a MetroVision plan, I mean, we have a, a plan adopted January 18th of 2017. We're going to have a plan as amended and let's call it April of 2018. It will reflect the correct baseline and target, right? So that, that idea of sort of a retrenchment um, really would not be observed. We want to make sure that people, that we are following through on the methodology um, correctly that we laid out uh, within at least the sort of background guidance document. So hopefully that will lose um, any sense of confusion around that and the way that we handle the, the amendment process. Anything else? Right. Just, no one has talked about the number 20% and the number 45%. So I, am I, is it wrong for me to ask that just to make sure you spend a lot? I, I understand the, the, num, the, the term is the hard part. I get that. Does anybody, anybody see any issue with, with those uh, targets? Like I said, we tried to apply a relatively consistent methodology that you all used before, which was achievable, attainable, but ambitious, round numbers, easy to remember. I mean, that was the approach we used. And in, in general, the year-over-year -year expected um, improvement uh, is pretty in line, slightly more ambitious than before. But again, based on three years of, of observed data, it feels, you know, achievable to us. So I haven't heard anything, so I just didn't want to lose that. And I think uh, Mr. Calvert captured this very well in the beginning. But, you know, one of the things we talked about at the time when the, we were discussing this was what you know whether or not it was easily achievable achievable with effort or aspirational and i think that what we kind of fell on was that it would be achievable and somewhat aspirational both so you got to you have to keep your eye on it it's not it's not going to um commissioner holden pointed out to a really good example is to put on his own yeah. yeah other questions or comments director odoricio so um, my question is, is I think I, I could see the kind of the wordsmithing that's going on with this piece, but the, the concern I think that we sometimes have, at least on the outer outer fringes of of the metro area, is not just the the volume or capacity, which I think is important, but also the footprint of services. Are there any measurements that discuss um, how? where that footprint of service exists and how to expand that footprint. So when we're talking about this, it's not just talking about the volume of where services currently exist, but how to expand those capacities and the reach to those further areas further out from the center. And I, that, that's a very good question. And I mean, I think that's an important sort of underlying component of that measure that I don't want folks to get to be lost on folks. Ultimately, whatever the right term is, high capacity, high frequency, high volume, we're ultimately talking about a footprint. I mean, this is a spatial exercise that first starts with understanding where are the areas in our region served by the best possible transit service. That is the starting point for the analysis. That gets us a series of buffers in geography that, that's our starting point. From there, we figure out, well, what percentage of our uh, residents and businesses actually have access to that high quality service that really is foundational to to the analysis associated with this measure so again the two ways to get there are to expand the footprint 
and bring more housing and jobs um, within the footprint by simply expanding it, and then where the service is adding population and employment to those areas. So I guess from a practical standpoint, I don't know if this um, comes to the board for uh, a final recommendation, but is the is this work group session or this work session group comfortable with you know staff has heard the comments about some of the verbiage about bringing that back to the full board and and then we can have a further discussion about you know which one of those feels the best to the overall board okay yeah I mean I'll lay out sort of what I mean this is a check-in before we ultimately produce uh, materials for public review and comment and we just Again, you guys spent so much time talking about this, it felt like we had to come and check with you. Um, to borrow uh, Elisa's term, we'll noodle a little bit um, as well as to what feels like maybe the term that feels like the best uh, version of a term that we can use. That seemed to be where most of the conversation was, and that's what we will put um, in the public review on comment materials. But the board still has a few bites at that apple, um, so we can obviously revisit this, and it'll give time, folks more time to, to think about it. Everybody comfortable with that? Director Brockett. Just one <clears throat> further thought on the change in the numbers. I just I would highlight the fact that your um, percent increase is actually going up a little bit, right? Because the you change the numbers dramatically down based on real world data, but the percentage increase you've actually gone up Correct. a little bit. So I would definitely emphasize that. That's Thank you for that. Point. Yep, good point. Okay, and Mr. Calvert has one other slide to go over. Yeah, I, I, I didn't want this to be to be lost since you're again. You're going to be asked to take action on a lot of things in a few months, and you've kind of seen them in drips and drabs. So I just wanted this one lad tie a bow around this, at least on the MetroVision side of things. Um, like I mentioned in the, one of the earlier slides, there are kind of two types of amendments that the board considers um, staff initiated, which is what I would consider what we just talked about, and then member initiated uh, amendments. And on the MetroVision side, um, that can be anything. That can be a word in the plan, that can be a new outcome, that could be anything. Though traditionally the thing that we most often see um, our member governments submit for amendments are urban centers that are recognized um, in the MetroVision plan. Um, and so the board several years ago previously established sort of the process that, that new and revised uh, urban centers um, use to ultimately make a recommendation to the board. And so you are going to see that a little bit later, but I just wanted to alert you to that. That's something that will be included in the public review materials. We had four uh, urban center amendments that were suggested by our members um, this time around, um, three that were pretty significant expansions of existing urban centers and then one proposed new urban center. So when the public review materials go out, in case you were wanting to familiarize yourself with that, you're going to see a recommendation of an independent evaluation panel that comes together to review these as well as a preliminary uh, staff recommendation. So I just, while we're in the arena of talking about plan amendments, I didn't want you to think that what we, what we just talked about was the only amendments that the board would consider um, related to the, to the MetroVision plan. Um, so as I mentioned, to kind of one final sort of closeout, um, we're going to start a public review period uh, probably in the next 10 days or so. Um, the board will consider all of these amendments um, in April, but just so you're going to see things like the RTP project amendments that the board took action on from a modeling, modeling perspective back in December. You're going to see um, an action related to uh, these urban centers as well as the performance measure um, that I mentioned previously, and you're also going to see some other very sort of more minor um, staff-initiated changes on the regional transportation plan that are about clarity, updated data, that sort of thing. So I just wanted to give you the full perspective of what you're going to be considering uh, for action. So you'll hear th about that not only at the public hearing uh, in March, but you also hear that obviously when you um, take action in April. So before we move on, I just want to make sure anybody on the phone that wants to weigh in has the opportunity. Okay, we will move on to attachment C. Thank you very much, Mr. Calvert. Attachment C is a discussion on TIP subregional share forum and uh, Mr. X. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, whoop, is that somebody? Oh, okay. All righty. No, so our, our topic for discussion today um, is the formation of our sub-regional forums. Um, you know, the 
uh, you know, the TIP policy work group and, and staff, we've now you know, initiated some discussion related to the sub-regional forums and the, the kind of the governance side and the formation of. So we wanted to just throw at you guys this evening some of the, you know, come, some foundational governance concepts that, um, uh, you know, to get your reaction to um, and, and uh, further discussion, of course. So um, just, just so everybody understands where we are today, we have gone, we have come a long ways, although I know it probably doesn't seem like it all the time. Um, we have indeed, uh, you know, reached some consensus and actually uh, through board action, um, in, uh, you know, have, have uh, uh, dis decided on several components of this new, new regional, sub-regional model for inclusion in the 2020 to 2023 Transportation Improvement Program uh, policy documents. Um, so first and foremost, we um, we uh, agreed on the set asides. They're on the, the red box on your far left. That was decided back in oh, I believe that was like September time frame. Um, and of course, at the last meeting, we had we uh, we had quite a bit quite a discussion, and we decided on the regional sub regional split, of which is 20% uh, to the to the region and 80% uh, to the sub region. And those are reflected here. Now, again, I, I feel I always have to point this out as the, the biggest of disclaimers that the, the, the monies that we're talking about here are strictly, it's an estimate. I think it's a little better than a guesstimate. It's, uh, we think we're in the ballpark. We should know more about this number within the next, next several weeks. We're, we're in uh, conversations with CDOT right now. So we believe we'll have a better idea um, hopefully even for, for the March board meeting, just to give you guys some, some ideas of where we are with that. But we do believe we're in the ballpark. Um, and also, so, so with the regional sub-regional split, we did that. We also decided um, and acted upon the, the regional share eligibility framework. And part of that framework was uh, we outlined the types of projects and programs that are eligible for the regional share. Um, we also uh, agreed to uh, how many that that uh, a who is eligible to submit projects for the regional share, and that is the subregions, CDOT and RTD. Each are entitled to submit up to three applications, um, and one of CDOTs has to be a reaffirmation of the central 70, 25 million that was committed uh, during the I guess the current tip cycle. And last but not least, the request for the regional share funds cannot exceed 50% of the project cost and is capped at a $20 million max. So, uh, so those are really what we decided on. I mean, those are big, big, heady issues, of course, and it, it really helps us. To, well, we feel we're on a downward slope now. We feel we get, we, uh, we, we were optimistic that, that at least we can, you know, start to develop a timeline where we can see the end. <laughs> so, so let's see where we go with that. So the discussion we wanted to have today is um, about the sub-regional forums. And I know there's been, um, you know, there's been some informal um, meetings um, within the counties to talk about the sub-regional forums. I believe almost every, every county has had at least some informal discussions, primarily at the staff level. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure if there are. Yes, sir. Director Holman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've had our second informal sub um, uh, sub region uh, meeting or forum, and we are already in the process of sending around our, our MOU to the various entities um, uh, that'll be eligible for for their inputs. And uh, we're looking. Uh, I think we're, we've got off to a great start, and I think it's a, it's a great uh, mechanism by which. Uh, we can negotiate with uh, all our entities to find what's best for the uh, for the total subregion. So Great. I think it's going to be successful. Frankly. Great, thank you, sir, very much. No, that's that's good feedback. Appreciate that. Um, now there's there's eight subregional forms that are proposed, and there's two two of these forms are not like the others, um, and those two are the city county of Denver and the city county of Broomfield. Those two counties are, and two subregional forums. Um, they're sitting right next to each other today, so they can um, you just separate each. Yeah, 
Those are a little different. So a lot of the, what we're going to talk about here this evening don't really apply to those two subregions because they don't have multiple entities within. Those, they're going to, we're going to be working with their staffs and as well as, as, as our board directors in developing a process. And quite frankly, they're going to probably face a lot more scrutiny than any of the others, to be honest with you. Um, so, uh, so, we will, so we're going to start that here real soon. I know we got some county, we got uh, some Denver staff in back that we're, we're going to reach out to real quick and, and get going. And I know there's been some, some discussion, at least in Denver, I I'm sure Broomfield's had at least some, in, some informal discussions about it. No, indeed, indeed. So we broke this out for you today in five different areas. Um, there's membership, um, uh, forum, uh, f formation of, of the subregions. Uh, who's eligible to submit projects as part of the subregional form, meeting postings and notifications, and subregional documentation. So we'll just go through one by one and just get your general reaction to these. Um, here we go. So the subregional form membership. Um, the one thing I would like everybody to understand that in in our discussions and in our you know in our proposal, what we're suggesting here, that the subregional forums. Their governance is really is an extension of Dr. Cog's governance, right? So, um, so what? First and foremost, for each subregional forum, every all Dr. Cog member governments will be invited to participate, right? So every local government within each subregional forum will be invited to participate. Now, if there's a if there's a local community that um, th that is uh, you know it. The, it's in multi-counties, multi you know, for example, Westminster is in, in Jefferson, Adams, just Jefferson, Adams, right? Jefferson and what? Aurorius as well. Aurorius is three. <laughs> so they will be invited to participate in three of those sub-regional forums. Now, there could be a situation in which, uh, I'll just use just as an example, Aurora, maybe there's a, in Doug, the portion that they have in Douglas County, they're not envisioning anything down there or... You know, they just wish to just concentrate on, you know, one on the Adams County Forum or something, right? So, um, so they may decide not. Excuse yes, me, one minute, please. Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, sorry, Doug, to interrupt, but just a question. So, when it comes to be considered a member, is it done by footprint? Is it done by a population? Is it done by both? I ask that because Inglewood does have a small parcel in Douglas County, but as I understand, no population base. So how will that be handled? That's a very good question. Um, so we're, we're using the actual corporate city limits as, uh, as, as that boundary. Like there's, there's communities that own property in other, other counties, for example. Um, they, at least based on what we believe, they would not be invited to participate in that sub-regional forum. Like for, like for example, um, well, give me one. Like, well, well, Denver's got, right, Red Rocks, for example, or you know, down in my neck of the woods, down in Castle Pines, you guys got property down in Daniels Park, right? right. They, because they own property, does not provide that invitation. Their corporate limits would indicate that. Does that make sense to everybody? Director so Flynn. I, I think, uh, Roger, your, your question was the opposite of that. You do have corporate limits of Englewood in the county, but not population. Is that so? Oh. How, would that, how would that be? Right. So, they, uh, and what do you mean by corporate limits? Because they're basically their city boundaries. Part of the city, in, part of the city of Englewood is in Douglas County. Right. Right. Okay. So, so how that, would that be? As for example, uh, your park in Douglas County, you have jurisdiction over that. Yeah, because we had a fire there, and guess who we called? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, in that situation, so how, how, how is that? Because it's incorporated, or you own property there, it's your jurisdiction. Maybe that needs still, still needs a little bit of work and discussion. Yeah, probably so, and that, that's something we can definitely take back to our, to our uh, TIP policy work group. Director Jones. And just one clarification about a doc, what it means to be a Dr. Cog member. Yes. We only if they are a member, not if they could be, but aren't. Correct. Right. Like Jamestown in Boulder County isn't a member. They could be if they wanted. They don't want to be, so they're not a part of this. That's correct. Yes. 
That's that's now this is at a minimum, right? This this um, Dr. Cog members shall be invited to participate, right? As, as a minimum, because it's an extension of Dr. Cog's governance, right? Get that. Um, so within each sub-regional forum, which of those Dr. Cog members, um, you know, you don't have to participate. It's just, you know, you you can decide that you can you want to opt out. That's up to you. But each each entity who does decide to participate designates an elected official or their designee to to be as a representative. So if if you all decide that you don't want an elected official serving on this committee, then you're more than welcome to um, to designate a staff person to to uh, participate on that forum. That's that's uh, full discretion of each community. Um, each form member entity will each have a vote. Now, th this last section, the last part of this about the voting and decision-making structure, what that basically means is that, you know, with regards to, you know, actionable items, what you all decide to do, is it just like a simple majority? Is it, you know, majority of those present? Is it 75 percent of, of membership? You know, those types of decisions will be left up to the sub-regional form, if you agree. Um, that uh, with, with, with that whole concept. So that gives you some flexibility in that respect. Uh, the other is uh, RTD and CDOT shall uh, both be invited as non-voting members. Again, you may decide that you want them to be voting members, but at a minimum we would request that uh, both of those uh, public entities be included as non-voting. Or you, I also said you may not. <laughs> I'm watching you. And um, um, last but not least is um, you're, you're more than welcome in each sub-regional forum to, to invite other, other regional stakeholders, right, or other, I guess sub-regional stakeholders. Um, it's really, at, again, at the discretion of the sub-region. So it could include, you know, um, you know, it could be transportation management associations or universities, could be chambers, could be members, as Director Jones suggested, you know, members that are, are communities that are not Dr. Cog members that are within the county, you are more than welcome to do that, but that will be, uh, you know, some kind of consensus uh, decision of the, of the sub-region. That is it on membership. Um, I think what might be best, Mr. Chairman, just take these one by one. Sure. If, uh, Questions or comments on this particular item? Director Walton. If I understand correctly, you can pool money together between the eight. Is that correct? So if you have a project, do you need to officially invite the the other one of the eight? That's a great that's a great question. Yeah, not not only can you, but I would say that it's encouraged. Um, you know, that's part of the discussion that we had at a previous uh, uh, couple different board uh, work sessions in that, and I think there's, there's a lot of agreement to that, that the priority should be those types of projects, you know, that, the, that reaches across these inter-sub-regional inter groups, right? Um, but as far as the actual, you know, just the logistics of that, I mean, that's a good question. I, I don't know if I've really given that much thought of what that looks like, but it would, it seems to make sense that, you know, if there's a project that you believe, if some regions, one subregion believes there's a project that they, they can work with another subregion, that they would probably invite that leadership, you know, to a meeting and have a, some kind of joint meeting or something like that. But we can give that also some more thought in the TIP policy work group. And I guess I would suggest that since the subregions are going to choose the projects that they're going to submit to the full board for consideration, um, being able to prove that it is a project that really benefits multiple jurisdictions and that you have buy-in from all of those affected jurisdictions, I would suggest is going to strengthen your argument for getting awarded TIP money for that particular project. So, yeah, I think, you know, whatever, whatever, you, can do to, whatever you can do to encourage that, uh, that, that participation through through the process is probably going to strengthen your case when you come to the full board. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's fabulous. That that leads me to a, a something I just thought about. You know, it's not just about the regional pot too, right? I would suggest that if there's opportunities within your sub-regional pots for sub-regions to work together, and when you present that information back to the full board, I would would suggest that that would be you know well received. Yeah, so that, that's that's pretty that's a good good idea. Other questions or comments on this item, Director Dozal. 
I think I need a little more clarity on what happens after the subregions have collectively agreed to their projects that add up to the amount that's been allocated. Like, for example, Boulder County, $18 million, 18.4 or whatever it was. So we've gotten together and we worked it out and we've created projects that meet the goals uh, of our communities as well as the Dr. Cog tip process. And we've reached that agreement and then we're forwarding on to, and, and during that time, staff from Dr. Cog have right. been there. So there, we're not doing something that is outside of what the federal government would actually allow us to spend money on. Right. So everything's per rules and per policies and per objectives and all those kind of things are all perfect. And so then we get and we forward them on to Dr. Cog. Then there's been a couple of comments lately about, well, the board here then decides whether or not those get funded. I know it's a final approval, but isn't it really more of a review and approval, not a determination whether or not they should be approved? And, and are we really talking about changing, possibly changing those projects after we as a subregion have already determined that they are what we need for our area, our communities? Right. I just want to make sure that we are not leaving a wrong impression here. My impression is when we decide as a group, and we've had all the people there that need to tell us that we're doing it right, and the projects are appropriate, and the feds aren't going to come back and slap us and not give us the money, that we then are really bringing them on for a final review and approval, but not to start over and possibly change our pool or our listing of projects. Right, right. No, I, I think that's a very good question. Um, you know, I. I do believe that, well, first and foremost, as part of this whole process, and it's, you know, it's stated pretty clearly, there's not many things stated real clearly in the Federal Highway Letter, but this one is, that the Dr. Cog Board has ultimate authority for the approval of, of the projects, the packages, right? Um, so I would suggest to you, and you are correct, that Dr. Cog staff, we will be at every meeting to make sure that, you know, what you're talking about is in compliance with federal law and all those kind of good things, right? So there's nothing that will come forward that will be out of compliance with federal law. So you won't have to worry about that. Now, what I will suggest is that, and, you know, I think this is, you know, one of the, kind of the, one of the cool things about this process is that the sub-regional forum, the chairperson, or the appointed person, whoever decides, will have to come back to the Dr. Cog board and they will present this package, right? They will have to explain to the full board exactly why these projects were chosen, how it complies with the focus areas, how it complies with the tenets of Metrovision, you know, those types of things. And I, I would suggest, I don't think there's going to be a, a situation in which they say, heck no, that whole package is garbage, right? Go back and do something else. But I. But there could be questions associated with, did you think about this? You know what I mean? Those, those types of things. I, I, I think it's very unique to us. Um, I will say we had a conversation with, um, with staff uh, from Puget Sound Regional Council who were kind of mirroring this, this process. Uh, and they, they were intrigued by that element. They don't do that mm -hmm. at their COG. Basically, staff, me, and my, my counterpart, just reports out on the packages from each community. I, do, I think it's an interesting element that we're, we're planning on implementing. You know what I mean? That, that mm -hmm. you know, <coughs> kind of just ties it all back together. I think that's a very important step in the process that each group, the eight, come back and say this is why and how. And because we can learn from that for the next Correct. go around. But I just don't want to leave the impression that we're going to actually come to this board and start moving money around no, no. or taking projects away. But it really should be where we can come at Boulder County subregion, should be able to come and very clearly describe and define how we chose the projects and how it's going to improve our area. Yes. I love that portion of it, but I just don't want to leave the impression that somebody's going to be able to come in and take a project out. Sure, I think that's well said. Okay, I got Director Jones, then Director Holman. I understand, Rita, that what you're trying to convey about um, having, hoping that the Dr. Cog board respects the work of the subregions, and I think that's a foregone conclusion, and it, it's worth 
having that expectation. But my read of the Federal Highway Letter couldn't be clearer. The Dr. Cog Board has to retain authority for it to be legal. And also, we're the final arbiters of whether or not the compilation of all of the subregions' work actually benefits the region. Um, and I, we should not lose sight of the Dr. Cog's role and responsibility of looking out for the full re region. We're, we're, we're embarking on this huge experiment that if we get, we all go parochial and think what, what's best for our piece of the region will add up to be best for the region, we have no idea. And we, get to, we need to make sure that at the end of the day that it adds up to what's best. And I, I think we should certainly respect the subregions for sure, but we don't want to lose sight of our responsibility. So. That's well said. Director Holman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in my first observation of, of the sub-region region, uh, uh, purpose and or mission, um, the issue of local control comes up. And it's, I think that's an element that, that we all, as, as commissioners, as, as city council members, et cetera, uh, it's something that this uh, option <coughs> And I, I think it's important that, uh, that, that w when the board um, uh, makes their, their final cut or decision on, on these various projects, it's important that we have a uniformed criteria checklist by which uh, when we're putting together our plans that we, that we, we have a compliant um, document that we can present that, that won't be picked apart uh, by, by, yes. the, by the individual uh, representatives on the board. Uh, we've had those problems in the past, and I think that uh, this affords us an opportunity to, uh, to at least reflect what the local concerns are and mesh those with, with uh, uh, the uh, commitment of multi-source funding and um, um, a, a, uh, an understanding of the importance of of fitting into the regional uh, 2040 plan. Thank you. So I wanted to weigh in real quick on this because one of the things that I envisioned, and this might be a strategic thing that each subregion decides how they're going to handle this on their own, of course, but one thing that I envisioned is that uh, subregion, and, and again, just choose Arapahoe County as an example, they have more good projects that they really want to submit than money available. And it might be a strategic, uh, it might be strategic of them to say, we're going to, we think that these two projects both have very good merit, or these four projects both have very good merit, but they equal more than the money available. So we're going to present the best case for all four of them, and that's where the board weighs in on which three get funded or which two get funded. So, uh, Director Dozal, that's, w that's what I envisioned with not that, not that the board would take the authority away from the subregion and the work that they put into it, but that there might be choices that the board makes that the subregion comes forward with more, you know, more than what's available. Director Walton and then Director Dozal. That was my impression as well that we, as a subregion may come with three projects, all that spend, each of those three spends all of the money, just as an example. Um, but it also, to the question I asked earlier about pooling money across subregions, right. there's no points that would be given if it's just going to be a stamp of approval at the board level, if everybody just came with the three projects or one, two, or three that. I'm trying to play that out, and, and so I guess I was making that same assumption. Right. Well, let me ask this, if I may. Are we talking about uh, submitting for the regional pot or the sub-regional pot? Sub-regional. Sub-regional pot? Mm -hmm. well, um, well, yeah, I mean, the board will not be scoring your sub-regional projects. The recommendations that come out of the sub-region, you will do that individual scoring yourself. You will do that evaluation and make a determination on which projects you want to bring forth to the Dr. Cog board, right? Um, so, um, you know, so at that point, that decision has been made. So the question is that, you know, when it comes to the Dr. Cog board for vetting, it was, you know, it was really what Director Jones had said with regards to what, what the purpose and the function of the Dr. Cog board is in, in making the final determination. 
Um, so just real quick, I know I got Director Dozal and Director Jones, but I just want to. So what you just said, Doug, is is a little bit different than what I had in my mind, Same. and I'm just want to make sure that we're very clear because. Um, what I anticipated is that, again, using Arapahoe County as the example, Arapahoe County has uh, three projects that uh, one of them benefits Arapahoe County Centennial and Aurora. One of them benefits Arapahoe County and two other communities. And they, when they grade them, they all grade very well. They're all projects that Arapahoe County wants to move forward, but they equal more money than what's in that sub-regional pot. Would not the board take action then in choosing which? Okay, so it's up to the subregion. Correct. To okay, well then that's that's yep. my misunderstanding. So just so everybody understands, so at the subregional level, right? When you get your your sub allocation of funding, you will do an evaluation project. For lack of another term, you would do a call for projects within your subregion, right? So every community within um, your your subregion will be able to submit. Okay, so and then 18.4 was mentioned. So in Boulder County, right? So that's the money that would be available. You would rank and score those projects. Um, we get into how do that at a, at a later time. We're still working on the regional criteria, which we believe at least components of that will be used for the sub-regional call. Um, but you will rank order those projects and make a determination of which those projects fits under the 18.4 that you're bringing forward to the Dr. Cog Board. So I've got Director Dozal, Jones, Atchison. Director Dozal. Yes, so that was my understanding, what you just said, Doug. Um, what, I, what I was hearing the chair say could also work if the, if the sub-region couldn't make that decision That's and true. wanted to actually bring the three projects and say how they may intersect with other counties and other projects that are going on, right. and then ask the Dr. Cog board to help make the determination based on the total region objective, like what uh, at least you were talking about. So that could happen, but I don't expect that'll happen in Boulder County. So <laughs> we'll know how we want to spend our money. But if, if, you know, it could happen the way, Bobby, you were talking about, that if you had three projects and you couldn't come to a determination and you came and asked, let's sure. look at them, as how they interact and intersect with other projects and how how to score them more like a regional project rather than a sub-regional. Yeah, very good. Okay. Yep. And then Add the other the question at the sub-region. Yeah, and so but I would think that most sub-regions and I'm almost positive Boulder County will be able to figure out how to spend our money. Uh, and uh, we'll have lots of projects and we'll we have some latitude I believe in how we determine what our projects, how we score or negotiate and cuss and discuss yeah. to, amongst us mm -hmm. about how the, which project actually gets moved up forward to the Dr. Cog board. Excellent. Okay, all right, because we don't have to use your scoring necessarily for the regional projects, but we should look at the objectives and make sure we not necessarily score them the same way, but we're looking at the objectives. Yes. We may be talking the same thing, but I see it differently. Scoring is actually filling out a chart. Right. Uh, but basing your decisions on a set of objectives is not necessarily scoring. It's actually looking at each objective and, and how it works. Yeah. And then my last comment was, um, I can't remember what it was. Thank you. <laughs> Can I just comment on that last one about the scoring? Mm -hmm. I, and I think you're exactly right. I mean, you have... Once we show you the regional criteria and we're working like, like dogs to get that done, we're, uh, we're hoping at the in next month's work session we're going we're gonna to do that. We have, we have a meeting next week to talk about it some more. So we're real close on it. But, um, but That's, the, That was what I was going to say about the re regional. We each will submit three projects, which is kind of like overkill yeah. from my perspective. We're going to have 24 projects and we have $20 million or something right, right. to spend. So it's going to be... Sure. And then the Dr. Cog board will take up those 20 or 20 plus projects and determine of those projects which ones can be and should be Correct. used in that regional project. Yeah. But what I wanted to mention with your scoring or evaluation of projects at the sub-regional level, you are right. You, we, at least 
personally, I believe you know, we haven't really talked about this a lot at the at, this, at the tip policy work group level yet. But you're you're welcome to use the regional criteria as proposed, or at the very least, you will have to use the core components of that, right? Which is the three focus areas: Metro Vision, Regional Transportation Plan. You know what I mean? Those those elements. So quick quick check in. I've got Jones, Atchison, Flynn, Brockett, Stolzman. Director Jones. I guess this conversation is uh, the more we have it. Uh, the more I get nervous because it feels like we send everybody off and, and you get to spend the money however you want and oh yeah we got a few regional criteria you should check that box the federal highway letter was pretty clear that there has to be regional criteria and that any other local criteria could be added and they would be considered secondary and I don't know that we have made any decisions about how projects are going to be scored um, so it seems to me that we need to, we as, as a board need to look at, do we want some consistent criteria and scoring methodology that all subregions use? And then they add the local, the local perspective for their particular region on top of that? Because otherwise we have, I think, a quality control or at least an inconsistency issue across subregions. And I remember the last TIF cycle, I think it was Jackie Malay that, that said, um, and we all went along with it because it made sense. If your project didn't score above a 50, it shouldn't be funded because it wasn't a good project. And so not only were you dealing with a finite amount of money, we were only going to score good quality projects. We should still adhere to some level of high quality standard, and it should be consistent across subregions. So I don't think we should be making promises or setting expectations we haven't decided that yet and sure. I guess I want to raise some some concerns that we don't want to uh, suggest that everybody gets to go off and figure it out however they want to spend their money I mean talk about spreading the, the well, peanut butter and, and not necessarily getting something that moves the needle on fundamental issues like right. regional traffic right so I just want to raise that red flag no I mean I appreciate that and I, I hope that's not what you thought I said because it's not I mean I, I I do believe that there will be, I mean, you will have, like, you know, there, there will be measurements now, the metrics you use, I mean, we can have that discussion, and you all can ultimately decide if the same metrics that are used in scoring the regional projects are used in the sub-regional stuff. I mean, that, that's a discussion we'll have next work session, to be honest with you. But I think the, the intent, and this is exactly the way Seattle does it, is that um, there are two, Todd, that that use the, the regional evaluation scoring exactly like, and some, they tweak that, but they still share the same core elements of it. So in our case, it would be safety, reliability, vulnerable communities, right, our focus areas, as well as the tenets of MetroVision will all have to be included in that scoring as well. So um, I know I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just flirting at the edges here now. I know you're not getting a full picture on this, and, but, um, but you, you'll get it next month. Director Atchison. Yeah, one of the things that as I'm sitting here listening to some of the conversations, in the sub-regional pot, you have a pot. You have a bank account. You don't get to spend more than your bank account. So contrary to some of the conversations going in, well, I've got three projects, and they're all great projects, but I don't have enough money. Sub-region, go back and figure it out. You don't get three projects if you can't afford three projects. So I think that's going to be part of the dichotomy you're going to have to figure out in the sub-regional areas. If we come to a loggerhead and we can't come to an agreement, don't necessarily come to the board trying to resolve what you have to resolve at the sub-regional area. I think that's part of what uh, Rita was talking about is we've got to work it out at the regional and sub-regional areas separately. Sub-region, that's all the cities and the county coming together, making a decision. These are what the representative of that sub-region will come back as the region and say, okay, in our region, here are the projects that we're proposing. Whoever that spokesperson is needs to sell those projects to the board as a whole. But any dispute among the group should have been resolved before it gets back here. Director Flynn. Thank you, Chair. Uh, 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 Commissioner Jones has articulated my concern probably better than I was formulating it in my head. But let me just take it a little farther, further, that uh, what I'm hearing is that each subregion within a certain very high-level framework 
is going to develop its own basic governing, governing process for vetting projects. It could be that adjoining, adjoining subregions, which may have, because transportation corridors don't really respect where sure. the politicians drew their boundaries, right? Correct. Uh, they may have different processes mm -hmm. for, even under this framework, yes. uh, for determining projects. So I, I find myself kind of wishing that a lot of this had been worked out before so that when we made the decision to do 80-20, we understood how it was going to be, you know, how that was going to go. Uh, but the last thing I want is for each subregion to come here and just expect us to rubber stamp uh, what they did at the subregional level. I want a clear understanding of how it fits into the regional, uh, the regional plan, Metro Vision, and everything else. Sure. So how how do you envision adjoining subregions? Let me just pick on Jefferson County because it's so big that the needs in the north part of the county where they adjoin Boulder, Broomfield, and Adams might be wildly different from where they adjoin my district in southwest Denver and Arapahoe County and Englewood and Sheridan. Mm -hmm. And how do you envision that working if they have different processes for, for uh, allocating? Different processes for allocating. Um, with regards to the evaluation of projects? Oh, sure. Um, well, I mean, you know, I think jointly those two subregions are going to have to make a determination on how they're going to do that. If there's a project that they feel there's a priority that they need to work across those subregional lines, then, I mean, I would suggest that they would find a way to do that. I mean, I think if it becomes clear amongst then there's consensus amongst the two subregions that there's a project that ranks high enough that it should be considered, they might, you know, fund it both, you know, half and half or something like that or you know, 70-30 based on where the project limits are, right? But, um, but that type of discussion is one of the reasons why we decided to have this type of flexibility in the sub-regional model, the ability to do that. Because if you remember the old model, right, was that it's, it, was, it was parochial, right? I mean, each community just submitted their own project with or without any conversation with anybody else at the, at the minimum this creates a collaborative environment at the county level, but we as a group, I say we, I include me and you guys, that we, we've had a discussion about, um, you know, setting as priority and an emphasis on projects that work across those sub-regions. Um, you know, and, and Director Flynn, I'm, I, I agree with you. I mean, you know, we've been pretty clear throughout this process. I mean, we're, we're doing this you know, we're learning as we go. This is all new to us too, right? And and we know there was going to be, you know, there's going to be some warts along the way. And, uh, you know, we're trying to figure it out as we go. But you're right. I mean, there's a lot of tremendous questions about how this will work. And, you know, that's why we have Puget Sound to help us with some of those some of those issues. But, you know, and, you know, even the conversations we have with their staff, they they readily recognize that even now, and they've been doing this 20 plus years, um, that, you know, they still come across situations in which, you know, it's just, it, it just matures as they go forth, right? So we're going to, I mean, I think the general concept makes sense. Um, and we'll, we'll work out, you know, some of the details as we go forth. But I, I think we just caution everybody, you know, about what this is. It's a pilot. So in the Thank you, I think. <laughs> in the queue, I have Brockett, Stolzman, Beacom, Henry. Director Brockett. Thank you. Actually, I was going to address just that issue about sub-regional collaboration because, you know, as we're talking about, we want to encourage that. So then I would encourage us as we set up the structure for the sub-regional forums to maybe think about how we could formalize uh, how cross-sub-regional uh, collaboration could work. Uh, so, for example, in, in Boulder County, I think like State Highway 7 is a big opportunity. And uh, we, it should be more than just me saying, hey, let me give Eva a call and see if she wants to work on State Highway 7 together. Right, you know? right. It should be more of a, hey, your subregion, your chair could call their chair and request it. You know, just something, something sure. that gives us a little bit more of a structure. Uh, for how to do that collaboration so as to encourage it and give a clear path. That's a great idea. I might just throw, you, you, I thought of something when you said that. Um, in our last meeting with Puget Sound, one of the things that they do is um, their uh, PSRC staff, they convene the, the chairpersons of each sub-region 
um, monthly they do it, but they do it throughout the entire year. I mean, we might there might be a situation in which we would do that that would provide that mechanism for those those chairs to get together. Potentially, um, I'm not necessarily saying create another monthly meeting, but <laughs> 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 right, uh, but, but something, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Dir Director Stolzman. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I don't need any of my questions answered tonight, and I, I look forward to seeing how a lot of this plays out. But I've, I've brought a few things up a few times, and I still am not clear how things will be handled. Um, and a lot of it's carryover just from the way we used to do things, and maybe we're just throwing that all out and doing it totally different. But I still don't fully understand how penalties for delayed projects is going to, to work with the new funding process. It seems like people who have had second year delays are sort of getting away with it. And we've had to sit, and, you know, nobody meant to have delays, but we, we spent a significant amount of time talking about how we were taking delays so seriously and we were going to fund them, but there would be penalties and you wouldn't be allowed to submit as many projects. And we, I literally have spent a significant chunk of my life listening to that. And then it's not <laughs> clear to me how that is being carried forward into this new process with funding. So it, it seems like something that needs to be addressed. And if we do want to just wipe the slate clean, we should just admit that and make that a clear policy. Um, or if we don't want to, we need to come up with some kind of plan on how within this sub-regional, because basically people, it would need to happen at the sub-regional level. Sure. And so then do you penalize the whole sub-region because of one entity that had delays or not? And right. I don't know how to answer that question. Sure. So I, I still have questions about that. Um, and then we talked a lot during the Metro Vision process about having measures for success so that, you know, in the past we have projects and we score them and then they get the funding and they do the project and then we assume that they did what we thought they would do. And everyone kept agreeing and buying in during that Metro Vision process that we were going to have measures of success where after a project was done we would have some kind of reporting at minimum where people would show a demonstrated successful outcome or not so that you could show the board, we said we would reduce congestion by 10 minutes, we did our project, and we reduced congestion by 10 minutes, or not. Right. Uh, so I still haven't seen how that would happen. And the last thing that's not obvious to me still is how different types of funding will be allocated. So I don't think we'll end up with this problem, but it, it just seems like there could be a scenario, a perfect storm sort of, where everyone submits the same type of project for their areas, and then we have an excess of one funding type and not enough of the other funding types to right. go to the subregions. And so I'd like to understand how that would be dealt with. So, and maybe that will never happen and we don't need to plan for it, but well. it seems like that could happen. <laughs> uh, right. So I would, I'd like to understand that better. Uh, absolutely. Great questions. Um, the first on the delay policy, um, I'm going to give you the same answer as I, unfortunately, I always seem to give you on this, but I will suggest to you that the, the, the entire subregion will not be penalized. Whatever that process is, at least from staff's recommendation and what we present to TIP Policy Workgroup, I would suggest, and we've had some internal discussions about it, but I'll be honest, that part of the TIP Policy document, we're just not to it yet. But I would suggest it could be a situation in which maybe um, a community that is, has had a prior delay and, and as a result has been penalized, maybe they had to pay a higher match on their on the project if they were to get it funded at the subregion or something like that. You know what I mean? It's just, that's just some things we've talked about. But, but it, we're aware of it. It's, it's on the list of things that, that we will bring before you sooner or later. Um, on the performance, I'm trying to remember what that one was. Just measurable. Yeah, and I don't need answers on all of these tonight, but they're just things that I hope we answer shortly um because oh, have oh, so this oh, yeah. is just post this, project right this yeah, is yeah, post yeah. project showing yes. demonstrating to the group how you were successful and then the last one was just allocating the different funding types definitely so we will definitely do that that's part of our performance management strategy um it might even be required in the tip now i know for cmac it is right i'm looking at steve and todd yeah i think so 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 yeah so we will be doing that now your other point question with regard to funding which is a very good one um, so just so everybody knows, we, there's three pots of money that Dr. Cog has available for funding. There's uh, uh, SDP Metro, Surface Transportation Program, that is the most flexible pot we have. Um, CMAC, Congestion Mitigation Air Quality, that money is really dedicated to projects that, as I suggest, to help improve air quality. So it's primarily, you cannot use that money for capacity projects, roadway capacity projects, it can be used for bicycle capacity 
capacity, of course. Bicycle and transit, pedestrian primarily are the elements of those. There are some intersections like operational projects you could, you could potentially do with that. And last but not least is the uh, transportation alternatives money. It's a very small pot um, and uh, that's dedicated strictly to pedestrian, bicycle pedestrian. So those are three pots. And the question is, is um, well, I, let me say it this way. I think what we will propose that you will know how much money you have in each pot. Each subregion will know how much money they have in each pot before you ever do your call or evaluation of projects. So you'll be able to match up that funding source with, with the project. Um, you're right. I'm very nervous about how we used to do it in the past. We never used to, um, you know, we basically used to make the money work, right, when we used to get projects. And it thankfully always worked. But, um, and, I, and I don't think it's going to be that much of a problem this time either, simply because, um, you know, the vast majority of the set aside, the $50 million that's in that, 49.4, are CMAC eligible. And um, um, like the Central 70 monies, for example, that's CMAC eligible too because they're using that portion for managed lanes. So I think we're going to be fine. But, but it's, it's not lost on us, uh, Director Stolzman. I just want you to make sure. But that's the direction we're headed. You will know the funding pots before, before you do your call. Director Beacom. I've listened to a lot of very, very good ideas and very, very sensible questions in that. Um, mine's much more simple, and it relates um, to the subregions working with each other. And there needs to be a process and maybe a little more formal so that you know that Broomfield and um, Boulder County would work together. How do we get a project that we can decide upon that we want to do that's going to then come for a final approval? Because it sounds to me like right now it would be two separate proposals, one from us, one from Boulder to um, go for that. How do you combine that if we're doing a cross sub-regional project that, you, that we've agreed upon? Right. Well, um, great question. Um, I think it'd be one of those situations in which when you do present your package of projects, Broomfield and Boulder, that they indicate, right, that, you know, one of their projects is in, is in uh, combination with or in cooperation with Broomfield, right? And it would be presented that way. Um, They're just I, trying to get to be so it's uniform. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, um, logistically, I, quite honestly, I don't know how that would work right now. But I wrote it down, and we'll we'll talk about it to policy work group. Direc you. Director Henry. I I appreciate all the great conversations we've had, and we've only gotten through our third. <laughs> Is that the first one? Okay. Just, first just, um, the others will go quick. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I, 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 those of you who are so concerned about the details, he has said several times that our next work session we will have more details. <laughs> um, several, several times. Also, those of you who are concerned about how the subregions are going to come up with their projects or how they're going to do everything in regards to that, I don't think you give us enough credit. We all are very talented people and dedicated people that are sitting here and responsible people. And we all have great staff to be able to work together in regards to this. And as regards to subregions that are actually crossing one another, we've, we've done that in the last process. I remember, you know, and then it was just one count or one region that took the lead on that project. I remember having one in uh, Westminster, which was Jefferson County and Adams County, and Adams County took the lead on it. So, I mean, uh, but like, like he said, the details will come out in our work, next work study. Breathe. We're going to make through this. I think it's going to be great that we're going to learn to work together in a sub-region area. Um, Broomfield, Denver, I envy you immensely, but, uh, you know, I, I really think we can have great projects. And Highway 7, Boulder, goes through Boulder, goes through Broomfield, goes through Adams County, Brighton, Thornton. It's a great regional project. So, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Director Atchison. 
I, I would ask that you start to think about your, I'm going to say the second and third bullet. Keep in mind, when they come here, staff members don't sit at the table. It's the elected officials, and it's the prime elected official from each group. So you've got to make sure that there's communication between those groups, because if you have one set of people going to one meeting and a different set of people going to another one, the likelihood of a miscommunication elevates itself. If you are the elected official being here at the Dr. Cog board, I strongly urge you to be the one sitting in those sub-regional committees because you're going to be the one coming here talking, not your staff. And if you have alternates that don't come, you need to be here. But when it comes to the vote, it's the primary voters only. Very good. Other questions or comments? There's people that haven't spoken. <laughs> <laughs> There's more slides. All right. All right, Mr. Rex, let's move on. Okay, great. So thank you very much. That was a great conversation. I got some notes here, so we'll touch base with Tip Policy Work Group um, on those items. So sub-regional form formation. Um, so what we plan to do, and, and as, I, as I noted earlier, I know that most of the, the, the counties have been meeting somewhat informally, just kind of get the legs underneath you and all that kind of good stuff. So we were actually, the Tip Policy Work Group, we had a discussion at the end of one meeting that um, they felt that there needed to be some formal establishment, right, of these forums. And we felt like after, you know, that we got the funding split now and the tip frame, the regional framework and all that, we feel comfortable now with going, taking that next step. So what um, Dr. Cox's staff is proposing to do is to send out formal invitations to, uh, to all the Dr. Cog members um, for those e for each sub-regional forum. It's suggested here that it's later this month. We'll see if we get to that. Um, it, it really primarily depends on, um, I think right now we're at least planning on taking these foundational aspects, these items, to you at, the, at the, your um, February 21st meeting for action. And if you feel comfortable at that time in taking action, then that will allow us then to send out those invitations and begin to have those discussions with the sub-regional forums. Um, but if not, we can wait a month. There's, there's, there's uh, you know, no major hurry to this. Um, so, so yeah, that's planning what we're doing. So with regards to Dr. Cog's formal role with the sub-regions, as I suggested earlier, we will attend every meeting. We'll divide and conquer and make sure that we have staff there for every one. Now, there may be some sub-regional groups where you feel that you want um, Dr. Cog to be more involved in actually staffing the sub-regions. We would be happy to do that as well. Um, you know, there's some of the smaller sub-regions, for example, that, um, that, you know, that have already reached out that might be interested in that, that type of endeavor. But you also, as, you, as was suggested, you guys do have excellent staff within your county, so, but we want to provide that as an option, where we want to help you all to the degree you want us to help. So help us help you. So, um, so that's that component. Um, I think that's everything on that slide. Is there Quest any comments questions on Questions or that? comments on that slide? Moving on. Yeah, right. Okay. Don't, don't, don't sell past the close. <laughs> right. Um, so let's talk about pro P, uh, entities who are eligible to submit projects. First and foremost, of course, Dr. Cog member entities are eligible to submit. Um, because of this is a federal process, regardless of if you're Dr. Cog member or not, you are eligible within that subregion to submit projects. So what was mentioned earlier, there was a community... Jamestown. Jamestown. Jamestown, for example. Yeah. Lakes, yeah. God, Connie got knows them all. Um, <laughs> we, those, those will all be eligible to submit projects. So the, you, when you do your solicitation, those, those communities will have to be contacted. Um, and then the, the last bullet is other state. I mean, this is kind of a catch, catch, catch me for everybody else. Other state and regional agencies that are eligible to directly receive federal funds. And those have included in the past universities, um, you know, TMAs. What else? I mean, I mean, we can get you a list of those that have submitted or at least been on our list before. But it does, you know, it's just just others that are eligible within within your within your jurisdictions. Questions or comments? 
Rebecca. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Karina from Little. Sorry. I apologize. That's okay. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't see it, and I'm like, ah. <laughs> A uh, clarification on that third bullet of other state and regional agencies. Would RTD be in that bucket? Yes, they would. Yep. So RTD and CDOT would be included in that bucket. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay. Mr. X. Okay. So agenda postings and notifications. Um, again, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is a this is an extension of Dr. Cog's governance, so it is our hope that um, that the the postings for these sub-regional forum meetings would, at a minimum, follow Dr. Cog's procedures in that respect. Um, so we were actually actually asking two things. So uh, first, I guess that you would follow Dr. Cog's um, uh, posting requirements, meaning that we post it in the you know the binder in the reception area, as well as we will also include those. We'll create a new page for our subregions, and we will post those on our website. Um, we would also request that um, you follow the posting procedure uh, uh, for the entity that will be hosting that subregion, subregional meeting. So if it's held in um, uh, Denver, yeah, well, Denver, that, that would make sense. You guys are going to do these subregional forum meetings. If it's held in Denver that you have a procedure in place for your public meetings that you would post that accordingly. And once you do that, you know, we would also then, you know, we would need to know what 40, well, basically, yeah, if we get it 48 hours in advance, we'll make sure we get it posted accordingly as well. Um, and uh, that the, obviously the meetings are open to the public and they contain a public comment period. We, we it, at Dr. Cog, we include a section in all of our meetings now that is a uh, public comment period, is an, is an item on our, our agendas. We would, uh, you know, at least at least proposed by staff, we would encourage you to do that as well. Um, and the, so that's the sub-regional form. That's the big committee within each subcommittee, sub-region. Now, if, if the sub-region also forms, you know, they formally establish some other committees, like a technical committee or what have you, we would ask that you follow that same procedure um, in doing so, because we like we also like our transportation advisory committee and as well as our TIP policy work group. We post all of those accordingly as open meetings and, and, uh, and all that kind of good stuff. So we would ask you to do that as well. And last but not least, as part of this posting and notification, um, local governments that are not part of your sub-regional forum, we would also ask that you include those in a mailing list so they're aware of those meetings. Um, it's kind of like what we do too. We have a, you know, uh, for our Dr. Cog board meetings, we have a, a, a list which are you all, but we also have another list of interested parties, right, that you would include those local governments in that list. Any questions on that? Nope. Moving on. Great. So last but not least um, is the documentation process. And in the, in the federal letter that is included in your packet, and I know you all seen it before, um, you know, one of the requirements with regards to that, before we ever get into the process of doing, you know, a solicitation for projects and evaluation of projects, that each subcommittee, or sorry, I'm sorry, each subregion um, uh, very specifically indicate what the procedure they are going to follow for the evaluation of those projects. And um, we can even provide you some examples of that from Puget Sound and how they wrote it up. Um, but also as part of that, you, we'd have to have some acknowledgement that, um, um, you know, that you, um, uh, you know, that you invited others to attend, um, you know, are there any kind of uh, sub-regional form, formation governance or, you know, IGAs, MOUs, whatever it is you establish. I didn't mention this earlier, but, um, you know, we're not requiring that each sub-region do an IGA or an MOU or some kind of uh, governance thing, agreement, but you, everybody's more than welcome to. And I, I think most that I've talked to, they are proposing to do that. Um, some may be more informal than others, but, um, but that, is, I mean, that is strictly up to the sub-regions to do that. If you feel more comfortable with that, then, then uh, you're obviously more than welcome to do it. But we want copies of those. And uh, any, like I said, any established procedures and the like, we also want to include that in our documentation so that we can provide that information to federal highways. That is it for me. Very good. 
Overall questions and comments on the presentation. Director Walton. I just wanted to thank staff for the details on this and I appreciate other board members uh, patience with those of us who are new and haven't even been through the process so thank you very much. Good. Mr. Chairman if I may. Yes. First please. of all thank you for that. Um, but I will I mean I've met with several of our board members whether they be new or old to have a discussion about this. If you would like to just have a one-on-one -on -one sit down with me to go through all these elements, I know, know you got questions that maybe you didn't even raise today that I'd be happy to go through. And actually it helps us too in making sure that we're, you know, we're, we're dotting all the I's and crossing the T's when we talk to the TIP policy work group. So be happy to do it. Did, did you mean um, experienced board members or old board members? <laughs> <laughs> Seasoned, right, Seasoned, right. Yeah. Seasoned board members. <laughs> Director Jones. I just had a question in terms of the, the length of time you think that um, the subregions will be taking for this and sort of the number of meetings. What's the sort of scope that you anticipate attaches itself to this process so we can get psyched and prepared? <laughs> um, wow. Well, let me say this. So if we, if we, you know, if you give us, you know, approval to actually begin to form those subregions, and we do that like, you know, let's just say the first meeting is in March time frame. We're not anticipating a call for the regional, we're not anticipating doing a regional call till this summer. And then um, the sub-regional calls will not occur then until the fall. So we're really looking at a process of probably six months or so for the sub-regions or, or more. Okay, uh, other questions or comments? So just a couple of things real quick. If you need a parking validation, please come up and get one. If you by chance did not um, sign in on the sign-in sheet, it's up here as well. And I wanted to mention one thing real quick. Um, our director of our AAA Area Agency on Aging, uh, Jayla Sanchez Warren, she invited me to an interview on No Copay Radio that I, we recorded last week. And uh, we, we spent about 20 minutes talking about the AAA. Uh, if you didn't hear it, I don't blame you. It was at 4 o'clock on Saturday. It, it aired 4 o'clock on Saturday and 7.30 a.m. on Sunday. So if you didn't hear it, I understand. But it was really interesting, and I just wanted to give uh, Jayla a shout out. She does a r really good job of promoting the AAA, and for the people who might not know the importance of the AAA, uh, it's over 50% of our employees work for in Jayla's, in Jayla's shop and just do wonderful work for the aging population in the region. And so it was, it was really a lot of fun. And Murphy Houston is a, a great interviewer. Uh, he makes it, makes it fun and keeps it light. And so it was a lot of fun. So thank you, Jayla. Uh, thank you for being a guest. And um, you can go on the website, nocopay.com, and hear the interview and anyone else that we've interviewed before. And I think uh, Mr. Atchison is going to come in the next couple of weeks and, and be on the... We're negotiating. <laughs> We're negotiating right now. <laughs> Jayla, if I may, I, Steve Erickson, yeah. it's on our website, isn't it? Yeah, it's on both. Yeah, okay, so you can find that, that the archive podcast on our yep. website. That's right, I forgot. It was kind of interesting because we were talking about when it would air and it was pointed out, well, it had to air this weekend because I'm not chair for much longer. <laughs> they, they introduced me as the chair, and that doesn't exist very much longer. So anyway, anything else for the good of the cause? Seeing nothing at uh, 539, we're adjourned.